Hello everybody, my name is Marie-Louise Pullmann and I'm a PhD candidate at Wageningen University in the Netherlands. I belong to the Laboratory of Microbiology and the Division of Human Nutrition and Health and I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present our work on dry chicory roots as a novel way to increase natural multiple fiber intake. I have no conflicts of interest to declare and I would like to mention that the dried chicory roots used in this study were a kind gift of whole fiber. In the following 10 minutes I would like to show you that we should consider natural multiple fibers to bridge the fiber gap, that chicory roots are actually an excellent vegetable to produce high fiber supplements and that adding dried chicory roots to the daily diet can stimulate gut regularity increase fecal shochin fatty acid levels and modulate gut microbiota composition. We all know that the amount of fibers we eat is lower than the amount of fibers we should eat, a phenomenon that we call the fiber gap. From epidemiological studies, we know very well that diets high in fiber are beneficial for overall health. And in investigational studies, we have established specific links between single fiber compounds and health outcomes. So we could bridge the fiber gap by adapting the diet of a person, the whole diet, or by adding a single component to the diet of a person. However, we were wondering whether there is an alternative. One thing we often forget when we think about fibers is how they exist in nature. Fibers in their natural form do not come as single component, but together with other fibers. On the left hand side here, I depicted you the chicory root as an example. Many plants do have starch as storage carbohydrate, but the chicory root has inulin. It actually is very rich in inulin and known for inulin. However, besides inulin, there are also cellular fibers in the chicory root, which are pectin, hemicellulose and cellulose. And altogether, these fibers account for 85% of the dry weight of the chicory root, which makes it an excellent fiber source. The cell wall fibers make up only a small percentage of the whole root. However, they act as a physical barrier enclosing inulin within them. You can see that nicely here on the right hand side and also in the little light microscopy picture I added here for you. In our study, we wanted to know how inulin in its natural form, so enclosed within the cell walls and mixed with the other fibers, affects the gut regularity, the short-chain fatty acid levels, and the gut microbiota composition. And for that, we used dried chicory roots. In order to study this, we designed a randomized placebo-controlled parallel trial with two arms. One arm received chicory roots and the other arm received mitodextrin as a placebo. We supplemented individuals with 30 grams of dried chicory root per day for three weeks, which I call here the main study period. The chicory roots as well as the mitodextrin were consumed in the morning by adding it into the habitual diet. The main study period was preceded by a rod in phase with healthy dosage. And finally, we had a two week period of washout where individuals did not receive any supplement. At all four time points, so at baseline, at the end of the run-in period, at the end of the main study period, and at the end of the washout period, we asked individuals to record these two consistency and frequency of the last week. And we sampled fecal material to measure short chain fatty acids and gut microbiota composition. I want to start with presenting you the effects on gut regularity. On the left hand side you see the stool frequency and on the right hand side you see the stool consistency. Both are measured at all four time points which I mentioned before. The treatment is always in orange and the placebo is always in grey. Let's start on the left hand side with the stool frequency. We saw that stool frequency already started to increase at 15 grams and became statistically significantly different from baseline at 30 grams. Moreover, the change, which is depicted here below for the change at T1 over baseline and T2 over baseline and T3 over baseline, the change at T2 was also significantly different from the placebo. 
Similarly to the uh, results for the frequency, stool consistency on the right hand side also started to increase at 15 grams and became significantly different from baseline at 30 grams. Also here I have for you depicted the change and we saw that the change at T2 was statistically significantly different from the placebo. Moreover, we found that the change in stool consistency at 30 gram was related to the baseline stool consistency, which means that individuals with harder stools benefit more from chicory root supplementation. A similar pattern was seen for the fecal short chain fatty acid levels, which are depicted here in this slide. Treatment is now on the left and placebo is on the right. Total short chain fatty acid levels increased after 30 grams of supplementations, and this was again significantly different from placebo, which is depicted here in the lower graph. When we look at the different short chain fatty acids and how they change, we see that the acetate was actually the short chain fatty acid who drove the significant increase in the total short chain fatty acid reduction. However, interestingly, we also see that propionate is increased and butyrate is increased. An increase in short-chain fatty acids in fecal short-chain fatty acids is not always reported for inulin supplementation studies. One of the reasons is that fecal short-chain fatty acid levels are only a reflection of the production and the uptake in the codon. And that we found a significant increase could probably mean that it took longer to ferment the chicory root, leading to a more distal fermentation and hence higher levels. So the next question we asked ourselves was what happens on the level of the gut microbiota? What you see here is a principal coordinate analysis based on breaker distances and it depicts the overall gut microbiota composition. Again the placebo is in grey and the treatment is in red now. At baseline the microbiota compositions on the left hand side are very similar. Then at 15 grams, they start to diverge. And this division becomes significant at 30 grams, which you can see here, explaining 7% of the variation. Interestingly, after two weeks of washout, the effect is gone, indicating how resilient the microbiota is and how it returns to its original composition once the dietary stimulant is gone. Finally, we look at which bacteria were stimulated by dried chicory roots. I depict here the relative abundance on genus level of the placebo in the treatment. And as you can see, there were two genera specifically stimulated, Aneurostipis and Bifidobacterium. We know from literature that Bifidobacterium can break down inulin into lactate and acetate. And these are substrates for Aneurostipis to produce butyrate. Both bacteria increased by about threefold at 15 grams and bifidobacteria increased even further to fourfold at 30 grams. Finally, we also wanted to know whether there was a difference between individuals in high and low baseline bifido abundance. And indeed, we found that specifically people with low baseline levels underwent more stimulation. This data indicates that chicory root can strongly moderate overall gut microbiota composition and also stimulate beneficial bacteria. So in conclusion, we think we should consider natural multiple fibers as they exist in nature to bridge the fiber gap. Chicory roots are an excellent vegetable source for high fiber supplements because they are so rich in inulin as storage carbohydrate, but they also have the cell wall fibers, pectin, cellulose and hemicellulose. And dried chicory roots can stimulate gut regularity by increasing stool frequency and stool consistency. They increase the levels of fecal short chain fatty acids. And they can beneficially modulate the gut microbiota composition. And with that, I would like to thank my supervisors, Professor Willem de Voss, Professor Hauke Schmidt, and Professor Edith Feskens, and the Laboratory of Microbiology, as well as the Human Research Unit of Aachen University for making this study happen and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for sharing your work.
Mary Louise, so, such an interesting piece of work. Um, so we have a few minutes for question or comments from the audience again. Please use the question box to type in questions and comments. I have a first question for you. Um, your intervention duration was three weeks. Um, and do you think it was sufficient to represent the long-term gut microbiome outcomes? What are the comp and what are the compound in the chicory root fiber beside fiber? In the chicory root beside fiber. All right, um, thank you very much for your question. So first of all, the compounds besides uh, the fibers and the chicory root are uh, also phytochemicals that are naturally existing uh, in the root. These are bitter compounds, um, but also like phenolic acids um, and other um, like polyphenols. Um, definitely also minerals and a little bit of water. So these are the other compounds naturally existing in there. Um, and so the other question was in relation whether three weeks were um, long enough to depict a long-term change. Well, we label our study rather as a short-term intervention um, regarding the fact that three weeks, in my opinion, are rather uh, short-term. So um, if you really want to modulate a long-term effect, I think you would need a longer study. But also the question is, um, um, whether that should be by an addition of a supplement or a whole dietary change. Yes. All right. Thank, thank you. you for your answer. Um, what method was used to measure the short chain fatty acid levels? In our laboratory, we use uh, GC, so gas chromatography, uh, for the fecal short chain fatty acids. Okay. And was the chicory root water soluble? Um, and so the chicory root, even if you mill it, is not totally water soluble. You will see when you add it, for example, in a glass of water, that the, the water changes and gets like a, this uh, um, non-transparent color. Uh, however, I cannot say how much of it is water soluble because there is a part leaking out into the liquid phase out of the chicory roots. But in general, as it is still in its original form, um, it would be like a drying a carrot and uh, uh, solving it like disso dissolving it in water. That's a bit how you could imagine it. So not totally water soluble because it is still included in the cells. Um, I have someone asking, how is a supplement accepted? Yeah, that's an interesting question, and I'm happy that somebody is asking that. Uh, it was really diverse. I had some people, um, so first of all, bitter is the taste that has the largest variability in how people perceive it. And um, I'm personally not very uh, sensible to bitter, so for me it does not uh, taste very bitter. And I had other people like me uh, in the study um, that reported that um, they just liked it, they just ate it. And other people are very sensible to bitter and those people um, found it very uh, difficult to eat it. They had to combine it in their breakfast uh, with options that would basically cover the taste. Um, so then um, this is, uh, so we asked actually people to really try to find out what worked for them. So they added it in their normal breakfast and we asked them to just try around how they could add fruits or whatever like they would normally do for a nice breakfast. All right, I think we don't have more time for another question. So thank you so much for Thank you very your much for having me. Thank you. Madeline, you are on mute. Thank you. I was on mute. Um, I was saying thank you. Um, Thank you to Marie Louise and thank you to all the attendees for typing in questions. This is what helps us make it interactive. So thank you for your engagement to do that. Let's now go ahead and change gears a bit and hear from Barry McCleary, um, who's going to talk about measuring um, available carbohydrates with an AOAC validated method.
The title of the paper I'm presenting today is The Measurement of Available Carbohydrates in Grains, Cereal Products, Vegetables, Fruits and Food Products with an AOAC Validated Method by myself and Kira McLaughlin at Megasun. The procedure described for available carbohydrate measurement was developed by Megasun scientists. The research was fully funded by Megasun and the procedure is available commercially as a test kit from Megasun. The importance of available carbohydrates is perhaps first highlighted uh, by McCants and Lawrence in 1929, where they recognized the need to measure carbohydrate composition of foods to help diabetics with their food choices. They um, divided carbohydrates into available and unavailable. Available starch and sugar, they defined those as digested and absorbed by humans and which are glucogenic. The unavailable carbohydrates were subsequently defined as dietary fiber. Several major diseases of the Western world are directly linked to available carbohydrate intake. These include obesity, type two diabetes and heart disease. So in terms of measurement of available or net carbohydrates, uh, there was work performed in 1860 by Henneberg and Starman who developed the WEND proximate, analysis, pro proximate system for analysis. And in 1900, Atwater and Bryant published a set of values obtained using this method. And this method and the values are still in use today. This would be described as a by subtraction method. So net carbohydrates is determined by subtracting from the sample weight, protein, fat, moisture, ash, alcohol, and dietary fiber, uh, all of which are measured analytically and all have uh, errors associated with the measurement. So the total error in determination of net carbohydrates is the sum of each of these errors, quite significant errors. The alternative procedure proposed by McCance and Witteson is a direct measurement. So measurement of starch, sucrose, glucose and fructose by reducing sugars after hydrolysis of the starch and sucrose by diastase and acid. This method was updated and discussed in more detail in 1991 by Southgate in determination of food carbohydrates, where he described a range of chemical, instrumental and enzymic procedures for the measurement of individual sugars and starch, which can constitute available carbohydrates but the described procedures are both laborious and non-specific. The analytical challenges in obtaining an accurate measurement of available carbohydrates, um, a measurement of digestible starch as distinct from total starch, uh, and measurement of sucrose in the presence of fructooligosaccharides, also getting quantitative hydrolysis of lactose and isomaltose, and ultimately quantitatively measure, measurement of glucose, fructose, and galactose. So how's this done? Digestible starch is hydrolyzed with a mixture of pancreatic alpha amylase and amyloglucosidase under physiological relevant conditions. Uh, pH 6, 37 degrees centigrade, and four hours, roughly the time it takes food to pass through the human small intestine. The digestible starch is hydrolyzed to glucose and traces of maltose. And then the maltose, sucrose, lactose, and isomaltose, the disaccharides are hydrolyzed by specific enzymes, namely maltase, sucrase, beta-galactosidase, and oligo-alpha-1,6 glucosidase to hydrolyze the disaccharides to glucose and fructose and galactose. The glucose, fructose, and galactose are then all measured enzymatically using the NADP, NADPH couple reactions. So this is how it's done. This is how um, digestible starch is hydrolyzed. The sample is placed in a tube as shown in sodium malleate buffer with pancreatic alpha amylase and amyloglucosidase. And it's incubated uh, at 37 degrees centigrade for four hours with either stirring in the bath showing on the top left or with shaking in the bath shown on the uh, left lower side. Then when that incubation is over, a sample is taken and diluted and an aliquot of that um, approximately 0.1 mil has hydrolyzed with a series of enzymes to, with the disaccharidases to hydrolyze all of the oligosaccharides to glucose, fruct fructose and galactose. And then after that, uh, the buffer is changed to an imidazole buffer and the individual sugars are measured. Galactose using galactose dehydrogenase and galactose mutarotase shown as number five on the slide. Um, 
um, glucose with hexachronase, glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogenase shown as 7, and uh, fructose using phosphoglucose isomerase. And they state that this is all, all happens in the cuvette shown. The reactions are shown here, sucrose going to glucose and fructose, maltose hydrolyzed to glucose, lactose to glucose and galactose, and isomaltose to glucose. And the rate of hydrolysis of these is shown in the right-hand part of the slide, where the sucrose and lactose are completely hydrolyzed to monosaccharides in about 10 minutes, and the um, isomaltose takes roughly 20 minutes. Having done this, then, the individual sugars are measured with galactose dehydrogenase and galactose mutarotase shown in the right-hand uh, bottom slide. You can see that reaction's over in roughly about two minutes. Then hexachronase glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase is added. The reaction's over in about another four or five minutes. And phosphoglucose isomerase is added to measure the fructose. In each of these reactions, NADP is converted to NADPH and the increase in absorbance is uh, a representation of how, how much NADPH is produced, and that's stoichi stoichiometrically re related to the individual sugar. Looking at the specificity of the hydrolysis of sucrose, we see here the HPLC pattern of sucrose on the left-hand side. Sucrose incubated with sucrase enzyme is uh, completely hydrolyzed to glucose and fructose in the center slide. In the right-hand slide, uh, sucrose can also be completely hydrolyzed to glucose and fructose by invertase. But then if we look at fructooligosaccharides, these, uh, if they're incubated with invertase as shown on the right-hand slide, these are also significantly hydrolyzed and would lead to an overestimation of available carbohydrates. But on incubation with sucrase, there is no hydrolysis. So in other words, the sucrase enzyme gives complete hydrolysis of sucrose and no hydrolysis of fructooligosaccharides. The quantitative hydrolysis of sucrose and lactose and quantitative measurement of galactose, glucose, and fructose are shown in this slide. Um, you can see that the measurement of sucrose and lactose of the hydrolysis to the monosaccharides is linear over the whole range of the assay. And in the right-hand side, uh, there's linearity of measurement of galactose and glucose and fructose with the method. So in Summary, the key parameters in terms of specificity is a method specifically measures digestible starch as distinct from total starch. Sucrose is specifically measured in the presence of fructooligosaccharides and lactose and isomaltose are also hydrolyzed. And the final measurements are galactose, glucose and fructose with an R squared of 0.999 linear correlation. The working range of the method is 0.18 to 100% weight for weight of available carbohydrates in the sample. And the recovery of added sucrose, lactose, and starch 95 to 100% across a wide range of matrices. Limit of detection is 0.054% weight for weight. Limit of quantitation is 0.179% weight for weight. And the repeatability or RSDR is 1.60 to 3.58% across a wide range of food samples that were analyzed. So in conclusion, a simple, accurate, specific and robust method has been developed for the direct measurement of available carbohydrates in a wide range of foods and animal feeds. This method was accepted as a single lab validated method by AOAC International and given the number 2020.07. This method is currently the subject of an upcoming AOAC International multi-laboratory validation the question is, would you like to be a participant? And if so, contact me at barry at megazone.com. Finally, thank you for your attention. Okay. Thanks for sharing your work, Barry. I think Sarah is going to join us to answer a question. So he, yeah. if you have question, please use the, the question box to type in question and comment. Hello? Can, can, can you hear us okay? 
Yes, I can hear. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Perfect. Then I'm going to I just want to um, very capable hands. Sorry, I just want to apologize on behalf of um, Professor Perry not being able to answer the questions. No, no worries. We know that you were a co-author on the abstract. So thrilled that we can have you join us instead. So with that, I'm going to leave you in the very capable hands of Kira to ask some questions. It looks like we've got a couple that have come in. Yes, we do. So how, how do isomaltolicosaccharide respond to this test? Um, in terms of the um, isomalto oligosaccharides, um, in terms of the, the first uh, incubation that with PAA and AMG, we would have um, a breakdown of the IOMOs to glucose and also isomaltose. So within the um, second enzyme incubation, we have included another enzyme, which is oligo 16 alpha glucosidase. This would then break down the isomaltose to glucose um, for then measurement in the, um, the test. Okay. Um, someone is asking, compared to Southgate methods, how long does it take to use your method? Um, well, the longest part of it would be in terms of the, the incubation, the four-hour incubation. Um, but this is based off of um, like ileostomy data um, in terms of the residence of food in the small intestine. So this is why the incubation period with PAA and AMG has been chosen for four hours. Um, after this, it's it's really it's not um, too long of an assay. Um, there'd be another half hour incubation with the the mix of enzyme, which is the mix of sucrase beta galactosidase and the oligo 16 alpha galactosidase this would be a half an hour incubation and then the the final incubation would altogether be about 20 minutes okay um, i have another question so what is the difference between sucrase and invertase um, and a comment it's quite fascinating that invertase can break down fast so well um, yeah, this actually came from another kit of magazines, um, K. Fruk. It's in the measurement of uh, fructin. So we, it was noticed that the invertase actually had an effect on fructooligosaccharides. So therefore, it, like if that was that enzyme was to be used um, within our kit, it would cause an overestimation of the available carbohydrates. So therefore, um, another enzyme, the sucrase. This um, only has does not have action on the fructooligosaccharides. Therefore, there's not an overestimation. Okay. And I think I have a last one if I have time. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, should these improved methods help to better measure the available carbs content and therefore in taking in such fiber glycemic response studies compared to other methods. Sorry, could you repeat that? So I think I'm going to give more detail. So the amount of dietary available carbs should be the same between the fiber treatment and the control group when evaluating the effect of dietary fiber on glycemic response. Do you think these improved methods can help to better measure the available carbs content and therefore intake in such glycemic response studies compared to other methods? Uh, yes, um, we believe that uh, with this method we have um, a correct estimation of the levels of glucose and um, fructose collected within um, your food sample. Um, and then we would be then, like we don't have a, a kit regards to measuring glycemic index, but this can be looked at in the future. I think we don't have any additional questions. Nope, fantastic. And um, thank you, Sarah. We know that this was a last minute jump on for you. Um, 
So appreciate your flexibility there. Um, with that, let's let's now hear from Kirsty, who's going to talk about um, modeling of human health impacts of fiber enrichment on that. So please. Hello, my name is Kirsty Kaneen Adams. I'm a senior scientist of global nutrition with Tate and Lyle, and I'd like to present today Tate and Lyle and Creme Global's work on appraising the human health impacts of fiber enrichment through reformulation modeling. Our disclosures are that three of our authors are employees of Tate and Lyle, two of the authors are employees of Creme Global, and this research was funded by Tate and Lyle in uh, London. So I'd like to go through uh, the aims of reformulation in the, in the food and beverage industry. And ultimately the goal is to improve public health through enhancing the nutrition quality of foods. And we do this because we want to allow consumers to continue eating the products that they enjoy. We want to reduce the intake of less desirable nutrients such as sugar and sodium. We want to increase the intakes of beneficial nutrients such as fiber and folate. And ultimately, we want to fortify with nutrients that might be lost in processing or might not even be present to begin with. So in our study, our primary objective was to conduct a statistical modeling study to understand how fiber enrichment can impact public health measures. And we did this utilizing the National Diet and Nutrition Survey results from year seven and eight of the rolling program in the UK. And this was data from 2014 to 2016 and was published in 2018 that included ages one to 94 and was over 2,700 uh, people in that uh, cohort. The categories we looked at reformulation were bakery, beverages, confectionery, dairy and dairy alternatives, soups, sauces, and dressings. And our intervention was considered 50% of the eligible market to uh, change and increase their amount of fiber. And we considered this a conservative amount at 50%. Obviously not every uh, food and beverage is going to reformulate. So we chose a uh, 50% uh, market share. And we looked at the daily uh, DRVs of adults, uh, considering that to be a, uh, at 30 grams of fiber a day. And our three main outcomes were weight change, cardiovascular health, and type 2 diabetes. So again, we did a 50% market share, but how did we increase our level of fiber reformulation? So we considered the guidance on nutrition claims of the European Commission and EU legislation for nutrition nutrition claims, and they state that a food or beverage must contain three grams of fiber per 100 grams of food, or one and a half grams of fiber per 100 kilocalories of a beverage to be labeled as a source of fiber. It must be six grams of fiber per 100 grams of a food to be labeled high fiber. And this is similar to the regulations here in the U.S. of 10 percent uh, daily value to be a good source and 20% to be considered a high source uh, or an excellent source of dietary fiber. So for foods that had less than three grams, this is on the left hand side here, uh, foods that had less than three grams, we brought that uh, level to three grams per 100 gram of the food or beverage. For foods that contain greater than uh, three grams of fiber, we added three grams. So let's say it was 4.5 grams of fiber and a hundred gram food, we would add three grams, bringing that food modeled to 7.5 grams of fiber. If a beverage had less than 1.5 grams of fiber per hundred uh, kilocalories, we increase that to 1.5 grams of fiber. And if a food or beverage had zero, uh, we left it at zero because that might not be a food or beverage that would have fiber added to it. We wanted this to be a realistic um, modeling of uh, fiber fortifications. So to evaluate the health outcomes of this added fiber, uh, we used uh, three main sources of modeling. For weight changed, we looked at Reynolds et al. Lancet publication from 2019. 
on how they category subjects into either low 0.25 grams of fiber a day, uh, excuse me, 0, 0.0 to 25 grams of fiber a day, or high, which is anything more than 25 grams of fiber a day. Uh, and if individuals move from this low to high intake of fiber, we considered that based on modeling to be 0 0.37 kilograms body weight reduction. And so that's how we modeled the weight change uh, based on those publications. For cardiovascular health, we looked at a risk value uh, of polynomial regression was fitted to the population and a risk uh, reduction value was then calculated. And this reduction was only applied to subjects with an increase in fiber consumption and consumed between 15 to 35 grams of fiber at the intervention stage. For type 2 diabetes, a similar um, increase in fiber consumption was only applied to those subjects um, for the Q diabetes algorithm uh, who had a risk reduction and consumed 15 to 35 grams of fiber intervention. And the reason why for cardiovascular and type 2 diabetes, we didn't use uh, those subjects who might have increased their fiber, but uh, were still below 15 grams was because we felt that level of fiber based on epidemiology studies um, still might not have had a health benefit. So the sweet spot, so to speak, was the 15 to 35 grams of intervention. So here are the DRVs and the percent of population meeting their daily um, recommended values of fiber. And you can see here in blue, this is the baseline of the UK cohort. And no one, no age cohort here is meeting, um, they're all 15% and below meeting their recommendations. So obviously there is a need for fiber reform, uh, reformulation and more fiber in the food supply. And so via increasing the, the market share uh, of just a little bit more fiber in the food supply, we can greatly increase all three, uh, all four, excuse me, cohorts of, of the population increasing their fiber uh, daily value recommendations. So the two to five and the six to 10 actually increase by over 200%, um, the 11 to 16, but 160% in the adult population, um, over 50% then meet uh, increase in meeting their recommendations. Still though, there is still a fiber gap and a need for more fiber um, in the UK population. So here's our data on fiber for fortification and weight change. So the blue again is the baseline and the golden orange yellow is the intervention. You can see that there was um, a slight reduction, a slight shift in that curve to a lower body weight. Um, it's in kilograms on the bottom X axis there. Uh, it's, and we overall modeled that this would be a 0 0.03 kilogram weight reduction um, with 5% of subjects achieving this weight reduction. So this was not, um, it was statistically significant whether or not it's, it's clinically relevant in an actual study it is, of course, up to debate. But there was a slight reduction in this modeling um, that fiber fortification can, can cause. Impact on cardiovascular disease risk was actually much greater. Um, based on uh, the modeling here, you can see a much greater shift. Uh, again, blue is the baseline, this 50% market share of adding this um, small amount of fiber to the, the food and beverage supply is causing a great reduction um, in cardiovascular disease risk. Uh, the baseline was a 23.3% chance of cardiovascular disease risk within the next 10 years, and that mean was then reduced to a 20% um, chance of cardiovascular disease intervention. So you can see, uh, again, this is a statistical significant um, but dropping the population's risk of cardiovascular disease by 3% just by adding uh, more fiber in the diet uh, it can be quite impactful. Risk of type 2 diabetes with fiber fortification. Again, the blue line is the baseline. The orange is then the fiber intervention. And so here we have a mean of 5.5% um, risk of type 2 diabetes within the next 10 years. This was then dropped to 5.5%. Uh, zero percent risk with the intervention of fiber. So not quite as impactful as cardiovascular disease, still statistically significant um, on, in this modeling penetration study, 
um, but you can see that uh, there is an impact of, of fiber fortification on type 2 diabetes as well in the UK population. There is, of course, um, study limitations. This is only the UK populations, and the results may not be representative of other countries with different dietary intake profiles. This added fiber was at a level of 50% market share. And of course, this is algorithm and modeling, um, and we cannot say the exact um, specific and sensitivity results that might happen. And at the specific cohort of people, um, this is obviously the, the entire UK population um, in that database. But overall, the impact of fiber fortification using this modeling approach showed that just adding fiber to 50% of the market can have two to four times more people meeting their fiber recommendations. 71.7% uh, of people had reduced type 2 diabetes risk. 72% of people had a reduced cardiovascular disease risk. And there was almost 6% of people who reduced weight change um, and weight reduction. So overall, fibers can help improve public health and really reformulation of food and beverages should be encouraged for overall public health measures. Thank you so much, Christy, for sharing your work. So as usual, you can um, use the question box to type in question and comment. Let's see. Are types of fibers used in fortification accounted for in the model? So in this fiber fortification modeling, we did not account for it being a specific fiber type. So this is not beta-glucan or soluble corn fiber, inulin or resistant starch. It's just using the epidemiology data of more fiber intake in general. So it's actually not a specific fiber, uh, but just the combined dietary patterning and epidemiology data that exist. Um, a lot of it from Reynolds et al. publication. Okay, and I have another question for you. What type of fiber was used for the model? Was it simply more of usual intake or some specific type? It was just more of specific, uh, more of fiber in general and not um, one specific uh, uh, fiber utilized. Okay, I have another interesting question. When can we expect to see these findings published? I actually submitted to uh, BNJ just uh, last week, <laughs> so um, hopefully soon um, we will be able to publish this data uh, with Creme Global uh, authors as well. And um, I would also love to redo this data in other populations and other cohorts, such as the M. Haynes data in the U.S., and, and see how this might vary based on different population and dietary patterns. Okay. Are there future plans for modeling with specific isolated, isolated fiber types? It's, while I would love to do uh, specific fiber types, that can be harder based on the databases and the epidemiology data being general just for fiber um, as a whole. So we would have to look to see um, the richness of the databases um, for oat beta glucan, for example, or um, even whole grains um, to see if there is enough data to really get a, a substantial, significant amount of information around that, um, which is why we just used a general fiber, um, really just to show the benefit of that fiber is really important, um, regardless of the type. Okay, and so I have a more general question. So according to you, in your opinion, I would say, what's the role of the food industry in food and beverage reformulation? Uh, so as a former academic and now a, a nutrition scientist in the food industry, we of course want to encourage fiber re reformulation um, and, and encourage more fiber to be in the food supply. Um, I'm not the first speaker of today's of the Huni Fiber Symposium to mention the fiber gap. And so clearly there is a need for more fiber in the food supply. Uh, here I've, I've mentioned the UK, 
um, there's there's data for Ireland and the US and Canada, globally, this is an issue. So I feel like there's a huge role for us in the food supply to argue about the health of fiber and argue about making the food supply healthier. Ultimately, consumers have to buy those products <laughs> and want to consume them. Um, but we as nutrition scientists in the food industry need to fight uh, for good nutrition out there. And fiber is one of those ingredients for sure. Thank you. I think I have time for maybe a last one. Um, would industry have a specific mix isolated fiber for supplementation that could mimic general fiber patterns? Wow, that is a that is a good question. If there would be one fiber to to mimic all, and honestly, I. I don't think that there will be. I think that there is, which is why I loved the new FDA definition that it includes both intrinsic and extrinsic fibers as long as there can be a beneficial health effect. And ISAP and other groups agree with that definition of, of being a prebiotic and being a fiber. There is no one fiber to rule them all. Um, ultimately, we need a, a variety because we have a variety of microbiome and we all might have individualized personal responses for tolerance, glycemic response, cholesterol lowering. So those of us in the food industry should not fight over which fiber is better in a lot of ways. We, we need to just advocate for the field in general um, and, and increase consumers' awareness of fiber because honestly, I, it's a variety. Hi everyone, so my presentation today will be on the digestive health benefits of a high malaise wheat. Uh, the findings from a recently conducted um, clinical controlled trial um, in healthy adults. Um, so the study was funded by Arista Serial Technologies and all the scientists involved with the study were employees of CSIRA, an Australian government organisation. Uh, so it's quite familiar to all of us that there is a major dietary fibre uh, gap with uh, many countries such as Australia and the uh, US um, uh, where average intakes of dietary fibre are less than 20 grams per day even though the recommendations are uh, 25 to 38 grams per day. Um, so one approach to combat this is to increase our uh, intake of resistant starch which is the starch that escapes digestion in the small intestine and when it reaches the large bowel undergoes fermentation. And what's particularly interesting about resistant starch is that it favours the production of butyrate, which has a whole range of uh, particular benefits uh, within the colon itself and uh, systemically. Um, so uh, our CSIRO team have developed a high amylase wheat variety uh, that's high in amylase, um, which translates to around 8% uh, percent of resistant starch in, uh, a refined, in the refined flour. Um, this compares to conventional wheat or rice products um, that contain negligible levels of resistant starch in the refined grain. And what's also interesting is that the um, refined flour also contains high levels of soluble fibre. So overall, we see 10% increase in the amount of uh, dietary fiber. We've conducted some clinical and preclinical studies to evaluate and demonstrate the functionality of this grain. Um, the top graph shows um, data from a clinical study where we fed people bread made from uh, high malaise wheat and showed a reduction in the glycemic response compared to a conventional uh, flour and bread. Um, and we also saw a reduction in the insulinic response as well. Uh, in an animal study, we also showed uh, that the hyaluronic wheat stimulated the levels of sequel butyrate um, as compared to conventional wheat. And we're interested to follow up on these findings in the clinical study, um, which is the data that I'll present for you today where we were interested in looking at its effects on gut health, bowel habit, as well as perceived gut comfort. So to do this study, we recruited 80 individuals. Uh, they maintained a low fiber intake for two weeks. Uh, they were then randomly allocated to one of four treatment groups that uh, were either uh, low amylose wheat or conventional wheat uh, or high amylose wheat. 
and we also had a subgroup of either the refined flour or wholemeal flour. Uh, the individuals consumed five slices of bread each day and four biscuits. Um, and uh, throughout the study, we conducted dietary assessments at three time points, mainly to quantify the amount of dietary fibre they were consuming. There was compliance questionnaires conducted throughout the four-week intervention. And we collected feces at the uh, start and end of the intervention period. And these were analysed for short-chain fatty acids, uh, the microbiome using 16A sequencing, and also uh, protein metabolites. The participants also uh, completed gut comfort, appetite, and well-being questionnaires that were conducted at three time points. The dietary fibre intake for all individuals uh, at the run-in period was less than 20 grams per day. This was maintained for the lower malaise wheat refined group um, uh, who continue to consume this level of uh, dietary fibre throughout the four-week intervention. Dietary fibre intake increased to 27 grams per day for the high malaise wheat refined group. And the two wholemeal groups showed increased dietary fibre intake, the highest being uh, just under 45 grams per day for the high and low sweet on your group. Our main primary endpoint was uh, fetal butyrate excretion. This decreased somewhat for the low and low sweet refined group uh, after the four week intervention, and this was significantly lower than the high and low sweet refined group, which showed an increase in the amount of fetal the two homo groups had higher levels of fecal butyrate excretion, uh, but it was interesting to note that the homo's wheat group did not have a further increase in the amount of uh, fecal butyrate excretion. So the effect was primarily um, isolated to just the homo's wheat refined group. Uh, these findings uh, also um, uh, are supported by changes own uh, butyrate producing bacteria species, including Fucalibacteria and the Roseburia, uh, which were shown to increase for the three treatment groups compared to the Lamo's wheat refined group, which showed a decrease in, um, uh, in the abundance of these bacteria species. Uh, this data shows the fecal paracresol data, which is a protein metabolite that is associated with colon cancer risk. And so thus, a reduction in this metabolite is a favourable outcome. So for the high malaise wheat refined group, we saw a increase in the paracresol level uh, following the four-week intervention, whereas all other uh, groups showed a reduction of between 20 to 40% in the level of the paracresol. And once again, this corresponded to one of the clostridium uh, species which increased in the low malaise wheat refined and was generally lower across the board for all other treatment groups. In relation to gut microbial diversity, um, uh, I'm showing here the data for the Shannon Diversity Index, which is a measure of both the richness and evenness of um, uh, diversity. And um, what we found was that the high malaise Wheat group um, showed a reduction in alpha diversity, which wasn't surprising given that we're providing a specific substrate of uh, resistant starch, and therefore there's a certain bacteria that favour that substrate that are increasing in abundance at the expense of others. The uh, beta diversity was similar after the treatments in all treatment groups, but it was the intra individual changes that were higher, which also reflect that in specific improvement in diversity. And these findings are consistent with other dietary fibre intervention studies. In relation to perceived feelings of gut discomfort, um, we saw some small changes in um, gurgling noises and bloating uh, at the two week period and the uh, frequent bowel movements increased um, for uh, the amylose treatment groups at four weeks. 
In relation to whole meal uh, interventions, we saw increases in diarrhea frequency, frequent bowel movements, and also urgent bowel movements. Um, and it was only the urgent bowel movements that was maintained over the four weeks. And not surprisingly, we saw a reduction in constipation as a result. But it's important to note that all these changes were minor and mostly transient. And particularly as the frequency of the symptoms increased from never to only a little of the time. So it was a very small change, even though they were coming up significantly. Uh, other measures included abdominal pain, heartburn, regurgitation, flatulence, and uncontrolled stools, and there were no changes uh, for any of those endpoints. We also saw no difference in reported levels of fullness, hunger, or trouble completing meals. So the key findings from this study are that consumption of food containing refined hyaluronized wheat rather than refined conventional wheat flour increased fecal butyrate excretion and the number of short chain producing bacteria. And they reduced uh, fecal paracresol level and a putrefactive bacteria species. Um, the hyaluronized wheat consumption lowered gut microbial diversity, which simply reflects the high abundance of microbes. So specifically use resistant starch as a substrate. Um, and there were no major ill effects of consuming large amounts of hyaluronized wheat. It was well tolerated at the dose given in the study, eliciting only mild and transient abdominal discomfort. So in conclusion, these findings support the replacement of conventional refined wheat with refined hyaluronized wheat as a strategy to increase dietary resistant starch intake and improve measures of gut health. Just like to thank um, the CSIRO team involved in conducting the clinical trial. Um, Lima Grain Cereals uh, team, Pierre and Sophie, who developed the prototype wheat products for the study. Uh, Ken Quayle from AGIC, who uh, made the food products for us. And also Eric from the research uh, support for the study. And thank you uh, for also for the opportunity to present here um, at the Bahini meeting today. Thank you for sharing your work, Damien. Um, so we have a few minutes for question or comments for the audience. So please use the question box to type in question and comment. I have a first question for you. Um, how are you? Sorry. So how were the fecal sample processed? Wet or dry? Uh, well, the fig samples were stored frozen at the participants' home and then uh, transported frozen to us before they were processed uh, in a CO2 chamber. Um, and then uh, for short chain fatty acid analysis, um, they were processed according to the method for that. So, as a uh, defrosted wet sample. Uh, the microbiome analysis was uh, once again um, the RNA extracted direct from wet frozen fecal matter. Okay. Um, and is is the product safe for pregnant women? What would be a safe level? Um, I don't see that it's no different from any conventional uh, wheat flour and wheat products. So as long as you don't have uh, intolerances to wheat or gluten, then it can be treated no different in terms of safety uh, uh, for any conventional wheat product. Okay. And how is it marketed? Is it identified on food labels? Uh, high amylose wheat. Um, 
uh, I'm not a, uh, so familiar with that. Katie may be able to uh, comment. Um, the product's not available here in Australia yet. So there are a couple of products that are just being launched in the US. So um, she would probably be the best person to comment on that. Uh, but it's uh, currently marked under the Fiber Sense um, logo, I believe. Okay. Do we have any other question? Yep. And I suppose just as waiting, I'd just also like to thank the organisers for uh, organising the conference and allowing me to present the, the work here today.